Alrighty, let us wrap up. There's one more example I want to do with rotation. And then we're going to do uh, start something completely new, move on from rotation. So if you're completely sick, completely lost, we're done with rotation. Torque and angular momentum definitely are the hardest, I, I think, the hardest concepts in this course. Um, so what I would ever expect of you is more conceptual, you know, more akin to the sorts of problems that you'll see on the homework and that we'll do in person. Those are the ones I would, I would focus on and making sure you understand. Everything else I would say focus more on just getting the general gist uh, for angular motion. All right, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to go through the example of the gyroscope. And this actually ties into a demo I showed on the very first day of class. Um, that was an example of how physics can sometimes do very unexpected, uh, interesting things. So the gyroscope can be thought of as, you know, say, um, the demo I did at the beginning of class is I had a spinning bicycle wheel that I suspended by a single thread on one side of the wheel. A gyroscope could also be that you have a spinning wheel and you try to balance the entire wheel on the tip of your finger. You know, just to give an example of, um, let's, I can just show the example and then we can try to understand it. You know, the idea with having a bicycle wheel that is attached to a string, the wheel itself is not rotating. If I were to let go, it just falls over. Now I can say it rotates, in this case counterclockwise, according to the uh, uh, way the video is recorded. But if I take the same wheel, it's wrapped up, um, and Lab Tech John uh, gives it a good spin. And then I do the same thing. Now the wheel doesn't fall over. Now the wheel just spins in, uh, around in a circle. I would say it precesses. Uh, the, the wheel continues spinning and precesses uh, around in a circle. How can we generally understand uh, what's going on in this case? Let's take the first example where the wheel or the gyroscope. So here I have essentially the wheel that I showed you, but I have it kind of supported at, on one pivot. You can buy little toys that are essentially like this, uh, where you have a little spinning wheel that there's a little balance uh, display for it. Or you can think of that little triangle as me holding it up uh, by a string. And it's not rotating at all. There's no initial rotation. I'll even move this out, out of the screen. There's no initial rotation going on. What happens? Intuitively, it falls over. Can we think of this in terms of torque and understand what's going on in terms of torque? In this case, I would say that there is some axis of rotation, which is the pivot here. And the wheel itself is feeling a pull due to gravity. So there is some gravitational force pulling it down towards the ground. That pull is not occurring at the axis of rotation. So there is some moment arm that wants to make the object therefore rotate about some axis of rotation. You might say this does not look like rotation at all. The wheel just falls over. But nonetheless, there is motion about the axis of rotation in this case. Now, while it's not you know true circular motion, uh, nonetheless, there's motion relative to the axis of rotation, um, which allows it to, uh, uh, which gives it some angular momentum. The torque in this case is that moment arm crossed with the gravitational uh, vector. And not worrying so much about magnitudes, but just thinking about directions. You know, if I point my right fingers along R and then down towards uh, the force, 
uh, as I'm staring at it on my screen, uh, my thumb points out of the page. So it points out of the page. As a result, um, if we think of this in terms of angular momentum, external net torques change the angular momentum vector. So I would say that this then wants the angular momentum vector to point out of, the, out of the page. It's going to try to take whatever the angular momentum vector currently is and pull it over so that it then points you know, out of the screen or out of the page. But in this case, where there was no initial rotation, there was no angular momentum initially. It was just stationary. There was no movement. There was no rotation. There was no initial angular momentum. And then when I let it go, gravity torqued the object uh, by pulling it downward. That created a torque that pointed out of the page. Therefore, after some time delta t, L indeed pointed out of the page. And if I think if L pointed out of the page, L is parallel to the angular velocity, which implies that the angular velocity points out of the page. So if I imagine an angular velocity that points out of the page. You know, my thumb, again, thinking of the right-hand rule, my thumb points along the direction of the angular velocity, and then my right-hand fingers rotate in the direction that the object is rotating in. If the omega vector points out of the page, my right-hand fingers rotate counterclockwise. As a result, the object falls over in the counterclockwise direction. And the thing just plops over. Now let's take the more interesting example where I get the wheel spinning initially. And then I suspend it up, you know, by a, a, a string, or maybe I put it on some sort of pivot, um, like what I've drawn. So there's initially some spin. There is some initially some angular momentum. Pointing, you know, along omega or in this case, to the left, as the, draw, as, the, uh, as the figure shows. There is, of course, a torque on, on the system. Um, gravity pulls downward. And about uh, a different rotation axis, now the pivot, there is a torque from that pivot point uh, that has some uh, moment arm R. There nonetheless is still a non-zero gravitational torque, you know, R cross F sub G, which still points out of the page. As, as, as is drawn. In this case, that implies that dl dt, which equals the net external torque on the system, um, which itself points out of the page, means that L wants to swing 
over to also point out of the page. There already is an angular momentum vector, but there's a torque that is pointing perpendicular to that angular momentum vector. So what it wants to do is it wants to take the angular momentum vector and, and pull it around so that it eventually points in the same direction as the torque. That causes the entire uh, wheel, you know, just based on kind of what I just did, that causes the entire wheel to essentially start to rotate around um, and point in a different direction. It is taking that angular momentum vector and pulling it around. The fact that the angular momentum vector existed is key. Because before, in the case where there was no rotation, uh, there was no angular momentum vector to tweak. Uh, so it just plopped over. Now in the case where there was initially some angular momentum, torque changes the direction of the angular momentum. Just again, this is completely analogous to how forces change the net momentum. Torques change the net angular momentum. So what happens is that that angular momentum gets pulled to point in the same direction as the torque, and eventually, uh, you know, eventually the wheel might be pointing in some other direction. Um, you know, instead of pointing directly to the left, maybe it's pointing kind of out of the screen in a sense. But then what happens, what, what's going on with the torque? In this case, gravity is still pulling down, but the moment arm has also shifted because the entire wheel has rotated a bit. Again, R cross F, if I do the cross product, the cross product um, points somewhere, you know, now the cross product itself, the, t the direction of the torque is not out of the screen anymore, but it's at a 90 degree angle from the direction that the wheel is rotating where the angular velocity vector is. So as a, as a result, the wheel rotates even more. So now it might rotate over to here. Yeah, so we got this, goes down to this, which hops over to this. And then it's the same sort of thing. Um, gravity pulls down, there's a moment arm. As a result, the cross product or the torque points still perpendicular. And as a result, the torque is always pulling the angular momentum vector to just sweep around in a circle. And since the angular momentum vector is also the direction of the angular velocity, that just means that the object is rotating, but the rotation is just sweeping around in a much larger, slower moving circle. This is called uh, precession. So we say that the gyroscope precesses around that second pivot point while it itself keeps rotating around, you know, the wheel itself is continuously spinning at a much faster rate than the rate that the wheel is processing. And you might say, what happens to this angular velocity? You know, the wheel is spinning. There was this original angular velocity that it had, you know, this thing here. And if you think about it, if you just look at the wheel itself, There is some rotation axis that the wheel is rotating about. You know, there's some omega, and the wheel itself is doing its thing by rotating around in a circle. And gravity is acting right at the center of that circle, like how we've drawn it in the previous diagrams. So gravity itself is not torquing the spinning wheel. So nothing about the spin of the wheel is changing at all. The only thing that's changing is that the entire wheel as an, as an object is rotating around. So essentially there are two axes of rotation that are going on. There's the spinning wheel, which gives it angular momentum. And then torque is trying to pull that angular momentum in a particular direction, which causes the entire object to rotate. So again, that is the idea behind why when there's no angular momentum vector to pull, uh, the wheel gets some angular momentum, 
but just as in it rotates and plops over. As compared to when we give the wheel some angular momentum, then that angular momentum vector gets pulled around um, because of that gravitational torque and as a result, um, precesses or rotates in place. You can actually calculate what this rate of precession would be uh, and your book goes through the derivation if you're interested. All right, time for something completely different. We won't leave rotation behind, but we'll mostly see circular motion from here on out. I wanna talk about space. I wanna talk about gravity. I wanna talk about how the universe works on a large scale. Gravity for this course has been that one interesting long range force that has behaved slightly differently than the rest of the other forces we've encountered in this class. Every single other force we've encountered in this class has been a contact force. There has to be direct contact between two objects in order for a force to exist. Unfortunately, there was a good number of students who, uh, for one of the exam questions, when there was a box that was being pushed up the ramp, you know, it was, being, it was launched from a launcher and then the, the box moved up the ramp, not in contact with the launcher. But a lot of people had that while the box was moving up the ramp, there was a force from the launcher still acting on the box. No. Once the box loses contact with the launcher itself, there cannot be a contact force. The only, only exception in this course is gravity. Gravity is the only thing where you do not need direct contact to feel the effect of this gravitational force. And that made a lot of people uncomfortable. That makes, that continues to make people uncomfortable when they try to think of what it means to have, you know, to be exerting a contact, you know, to not, or rather not to be exerting a contact between two objects, yet the earth definitely feels a tug from the sun. We definitely feel a tug from the earth, even when we're, in, when we jump into the air. The moon feels a tug from the earth. And by Newton's third law, the earth feels a tug from the moon. Yet they are clearly not touching one another. The nature of these long range forces really plagued uh, in people in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, Maxwell came up with a lot of interesting ideas of how to describe these long range forces but he was particularly interested in, in electromagnetism, a lot of what you will do in physics three, where he came up with this ether theory where actually there is a contact, but there we're all kind of immersed in this goo, which he called the ether, which was a point of contact that allowed objects to transmit forces through this ether. And that was a way that forces were transmitted. In that case, the electromagnetic force, um, but gravity behaves uh, very similar. Um, but there was, you know, perhaps one of the greatest null experiments of all time was when it was shown that there was no ether. You know, the fact that we could not find evidence for the ether uh, disproved that theory. Um, so it still suggested that something was reaching through the vacuum or through the air or through space to cause objects to tug on one another, even if they were widely separated in distance. In the case of space, could be separated millions of light years away. The Milky Way galaxy is on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. Apologies if that spoils your night. Um, in a couple million years, Andromeda and the Milky Way will collide with one another. You know, we at least will not be around during that time. Um, whether humans are around during that time, I, we leave up to our, uh, to our future uh, generations. But that is because even across millions of light years, the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are tugging on each other through their mutual gravitational tugs on one another. And that's what we want to explore now in this next two lectures. We want to look into what started as Newton's law of universal gravitation, 
and then was there it was augmented was improved and developed further with albert einstein's theories of general relativity we will not do general relativity in this course but i will tease it a little bit uh in today's lecture is to kind of give you some context of what's going on and how we understand what goes on um across space and time in terms of gravity But to set the context a little bit of why studies of gravity became very interesting, particularly to Isaac Newton. Aristotle had come up with some basic idea of gravity, but as we saw with Newton's laws, the ideas of, of, of um, uh, forces with Aristotle were uh, somewhat flawed. Uh, he thought, for example, everything was supposed to be at a state of rest. We now know that things tend to be at a state of rest because of friction. Uh, Newton's law is actually a little bit more um, precise in that it says that in the absence of forces, something moves at a constant velocity. Uh, Aristotle also had some idea uh, that everything tended to seek towards the center of the Earth. This also is not fundamentally true. We seem to be pulled towards the center of the Earth. Uh, but the sun is not pulled towards the center of the Earth, and you know Mars and Jupiter and whatnot, they are all doing their own things in the universe. They are tugging on the Earth. There's forces going on between the Earth and those objects. Uh, but they are not all fundamentally pulled towards some stationary central Earth. And this is because their, their model, their cosmology of the universe was a little bit flawed in that they thought that the Earth was at the center of everything. They believed that everything rotated and orbited around the Earth. We now know that not to be true. The Earth orbits around the Sun. The Sun orbits around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is one of billions of galaxies in the universe that doesn't seem to be orbiting around anything specifically. But we also can't hold it against them, really, for, have, for people like Aristotle thinking that uh, they were the center of the universe. And I don't say that just in an egotistical sense, uh, though their religious beliefs and whatnot did make them kind of akin to the idea that uh, the earth was at the center of everything. But also you could just take the, your reality. You don't feel like I am hard pressed to believe you if you say that you can feel the earth rotating below you. There's really no observational, strong, personal evidence that convinces me that I'm rotating right now while I stand here in my office. And then if I go outside and look at the night sky, I see some stars. And then if I look at the same night sky an hour later, I see the same stars, but they've all shifted a little bit. Then if I wait an hour later, I notice that the stars have shifted a little bit more, where it seems like everything is rising in the east and setting in the west. And since I don't feel myself spinning, it seems like the night sky is spinning around me. Like as if Earth were at the center and everything was rotating around the Earth. Again, we can't hold it against them for thinking that. Um, there wasn't really any observational evidence that could disprove that idea. However, this led to a lot of issues as people were trying, trying to understand the motions of the celestial objects and what we call the celestial sphere, kind of what the sky looks like from our point of view. It looks as if everything is in a big dome that is rotating around us. And most of the objects move at the same rate. You know, the Orion constellation always looks like the Orion constellation. The Big Dipper always looks like the Big Dipper asterism. Not a constellation, by the way. Um, it's part of the constellation Ursa Major. But all of this is going on. Um, you know, all the stars appear fixed relative to one another. And then there, there were these occasional peculiar objects that seemed to be moving at a different rate than the stars themselves. The stars were all moving as one. But then there was that, that thing that we call the sun that it seems to rise and set every day, fine. It clearly is orbiting at a different rate. And then there's that big ass thing called the moon. 
it seems to rise and set. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes it's a crescent, sometimes it's not. Uh, okay, fine, the moon is peculiar. So there's the sun and this moon. Uh, those clearly are very big in the sky. Um, they're clearly not the same thing as the distant points of light, uh, which we call the stars. But there were also these other interesting wandering points of light. You know, there were a couple, you know, they know of five points of light, uh, which uh, they called Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And these five peculiar points of light also looked like stars, but they moved relative to the stars. Sometimes they, they were over here in Orion. Sometimes then they were over here in Taurus. Then sometimes they were over here in Aries and Pisces and Virgo. These constellations might sound familiar for the particular constellations that the uh, planet seemed to roam around. Orion being the exception. It's never actually in Orion, uh, but it's close to Orion. But the planets do seem to roam. Sometimes they're over in Pisces and then Aries and then Taurus and then you know, Scorpio. And they seem to roam relative to the distant stars. And we call them wanderers. And I don't know enough Greek or Latin, but the Greek Latin equivalent word for planet um, was, you know, or the Greek word rather for, or Latin word for wanderer was something like planetus or something like along those lines. Where now that is our common word, that is the word we use in English for planet. In trying to understand why these particular points of light moved at a different, in a different way relative to the stars um, was the subject of incredible debate uh, for not just a few centuries, but literally 10, you know, 10 centuries from Aristotle all the way up to the Renaissance in the 17th century. Because this was all still fixated on the idea that they wanted the earth to be at the center of the solar system. So if everything just moved around and remained fixed, we could understand that as it's just a big sphere that's rotating. But the fact that there were these few peculiar weird objects that rotated relative to the sphere, um, people had to decide what, what the heck was going on, of course, while also trying to incorrectly put the earth at the center of everything. So in the Renaissance, um, this was, you know, essentially right around when, you know, Galileo first developed his first telescope. This was actually even before Galileo came in and developed his first telescope. Tycho Brahe, which was an observational astronomer, he would have an observatory, but he wouldn't have an actual telescope he would look through. But essentially he would have these very peculiar, this very particular sets, sets of, you know, essentially, you know, large metal rods that he would kind of like line his eye up around and the rod would serve as kind of a way to direct what his eye was looking at. And then he would draw pictures of where objects were relative to one another. Everything was done by eye. And he would make very particular meticulous maps of where the locations of these planets um, were relative to the stars because he wanted to understand the motion of these stars and if he had enough data he felt like maybe he could figure it out mathematically this was before newton you know no laws of motion no laws of gravity this was just i'm observing something and i'm trying to fit a mathematical formula to this though i don't really have a reason why i have no justification for why this is the answer i'm just using data to just to say hey this answer I'm giving you matches the data. And so these sorts of observations that he made um, were incredibly, incredibly meticulous. Yeah, admittedly, the slide has more information than I'm going into. Uh, these are copy and pasted from my Physics 90 course. But what Chico Brahe did is he had all of these very detailed measurements um, but he wasn't very good at mathematics. Uh, his mathematical skills were not quite up to par to deal with all of this data in order for him to make, you know, as he attempted to make sense of all of this. 
so he had to hire an assistant, someone who he knew could help him figure out the mathematics, which led him to, inter to hire Johannes Kepler, to come and help him figure out, okay, here's all this data. We need to, we need to figure out what, what this means. <laughs> Unfortunately, Tycho Brahe was, if anything, human. And he realized um, that Kepler was much better at this than he was. And distracted by the ideas that maybe Kepler would figure this out before him. And then Kepler would be the one that gets famous and not Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe, while he had all of this data, would only give Kepler little bits of it at a time. Kepler knew he had more, you know, Tycho had more data. But he would, but Tycho would only give Kepler, you know, little snippets with the hope that maybe Tycho could figure it out first and then, you know, take all the credit. So Kepler was constantly trying to get Tycho to give him the data, but Tycho was very resistant in actually giving away his prized possession, which he knew. He knew if he could just have enough time, he could figure it out. And then he would understand kind of the motions of the planets and the stars in the universe. This is where history gets a little fuzzy because Tycho Brahe died a few years later and days within Tycho Brahe's death, all of his data in Kepler vanished from Prague. He took the data and fled, um, which raised a lot of eyebrows, um, which made a lot of people think that maybe something, um, uh, less, uh, you know, less honorable had perhaps occurred. And while we don't think that was, that is the case, um, that definitely was, you know, passed down through anecdote and history, um, for the next few centuries. People, I thought that maybe Tycho Brahe was poisoned by Kepler and that Kepler murdered him just so that he could get Tycho Brahe's data. People have since exhumed Tycho Brahe's body in the 20th century and studied his remains. And interestingly, they have found evidence of a large amount of lead in his system. Lead was very easy to come by back in the day. And, you know, that lead that gave some evidence that maybe Tycho Brahe was indeed poisoned by Kepler. Which makes for a juicy story. We don't think that's actually the case. Uh, if you know anything else about Tycho Brahe, you might know that he was the astronomer that had a gold nose. So perhaps, you know, one of the greatest combats of all time in terms of science. Uh, he got into an argument about mathematics with a colleague, and that resulted in a sword fight, you know, over mathematics. And in the, re in the aftermath of that sword fight, his nose was chopped off. So Tycho Brahe had a gold nose uh, that was, you know, infused onto his face. Um, but we don't, but it's not believed that back in the day that uh, there could have been a pure, solid gold nose that would have, that Tycho would have had access to. So what people actually think is that Tycho Brahe had a lead nose that was gold plated to appear as if it was gold. So it's actually quite possible um, that Tycho Brahe may have actually, because of his nose, his nose was slowly poisoning himself. Um, and then he eventually died because of lead poisoning. That's one theory. That's theory one about what happened to Tycho. And then conveniently happened while Kepler was nearby, grabbed the data, left. There's other evidence that suggests, I don't know exactly what the evidence is, but there's some evidence that points to, I think through anecdotal letters and correspondences, that Tycho Brahe actually died of a bladder infection because of his desire to be polite around um, the royalty of the British Empire. That back in the day, you know, when there was British royalty in the room, you would of course never turn your back to royalty. 
Um, and the story goes apparently that Tico really, really, really had to go to the bathroom. But of course, he would not turn his back to royalty to leave to go to the bathroom. Uh, so he you know, held it and as a result uh, ended up getting a bladder infection, um, which might have led to his untimely demise. Uh, that is theory two. Either way, not so good for Tycho, uh, great for Kepler, because Kepler took the data, absconded from Prague, uh, and then several years later published uh, Kepler's Three Laws of Planetary Motion. Um, using this data that Tycho had um, collected and was able to give justifiable or at least mathematically um, confident proof that suggested that indeed the earth was not at the center of the universe that we all that everything orbited the sun and the sun was at the center and then they thought the sun was at the center of the universe for a while that's another story but at least that the Earth was not at the center and could be explained with decent accuracy um, if the planetary motion, the motion of planets, the Earth, and then these objects that they called Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, if they obeyed what now is called Kepler's three laws of motion. This gave support to the Copernican model from Nicholas Copernicus, uh, who had you know, suggested himself that the sun might be at the center and not the earth. But it's actually quite interesting. The story behind Copernicus is that um, Copernicus came up with this model, and we now call it the Copernican model, that the earth is not at the center, it's the sun at the center. Um, but he was so terrified of the Catholic Church at the time, you know, that they would not be on board with this idea that the earth was not the center of the universe, that Copernicus published his, well, first, Copernicus was actually very, very resistant. He was just like, I come up with this idea, I've written this book, I'm never going to publish it. Just not going to publish it. Can't, you know, the church won't accept it, I'm too afraid. And so he sat on it until his friends eventually convinced him to publish the data and publish his theories. In which, at that point, he included as a foreword to his book that this is just a cutesy idea, please don't take this seriously. But now we, of course, call it the Copernican model that the sun is at the center of the solar system and all the planets orbit around uh, the sun. Galileo eventually came around and made observations of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, so he showed that there were other things orbiting things, not the Earth. So we knew about Jupiter, uh, but then he discovered that Jupiter itself had moons, which suggested that the Earth was not at the center of everything. There were these objects, the four Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede, that clearly were orbiting around Jupiter and not the Earth. So if the Earth was at the center of everything, that seems odd. He also discovered that Venus goes through a full set of phases, just like how the moon goes through phases. Venus also goes through phases uh, from our point of view here on Earth. And you can't get Venus to go through all eight phases of new, first quarter, full, etc. Uh, if Venus or Venus and the Sun orbit around the Earth, you need the Sun to be at the center, and for Venus and Earth to be around, going around the Sun, in order to get the full set of phases. So those those two pieces of evidence from Galileo, and then eventually from Copern uh, uh, Johann Johannes Kepler. Uh, really put the nail in the coffin for the sun being at the center, or for the earth being at the center of the universe. So Kepler's laws, what Kepler's laws ended up saying is that um, the planets orbit the sun uh, in elliptical orbits, not perfect circles, uh, but in elliptical orbits. So the idea there is that if you put the sun at the center uh, of a circle, and imagine an, a planet going around the sun, it moves around in a circle. That's one example of how a planet can move. Though, that's not the only way. So planets can also go around in slightly elliptical shapes, in which case the sun is not directly at the center, but it's at one of the foci of an ellipse. An ellipse is defined by two foci, um, and the sun being at one of them, uh, and then the planet goes around in this 
uh, kind of oval elliptical shape. And how elliptical, how cigar-shaped versus circular-shaped it looks depends on what's called the eccentricity of the orbit. Turns out most of the planets are on fairly circular orbits, which is an eccentricity of zero. You know, the Earth, for example, is 0 0.017. Mercury and Pluto are the exceptions where you can actually look and their orbits are slightly oval shaped compared to circular. And then things like comets um, are defined as objects that have incredibly elliptical orbits. You know, Halley's Comet comes around, you know, once a century or so. Um, and it whizzes by super close to the sun and then spends most of its time way off in the farthest reaches of the solar system. Uh, so it does a very um, elliptical shape versus the Earth, which is more or less a circle. Kepler's second law states that uh, it's the equal areas and equal times. So the idea there is if you were to draw an elliptical orbit and then clocked the location of, say, the Earth as it went around the sun, and say you clocked the location of the Earth every month. So every 30 days you go out, you say, where's the Earth? And you looked at where the Earth was in its orbit around the sun. It would sweep out wedges that might change in shape, uh, particularly if it's a very elliptical orbit. But it's done in such a way such that each of the wedges, if you were to calculate the total area of, this perp of these purple wedges, each of these wedges have the same geometric area. So that's the idea behind equal areas and equal times. The planet sweeps out the same amount of area in the same amount of time. An alternative way of saying that is that when you are closer to the sun, you move faster, and when you are farther away from the sun, you move slower. Um, which is why, for example, Halley's Comet spends most of its century-year-long orbit uh, really far away from the sun and then spends a month or so really close to the sun, which is why we have to, you know, we only can see it, you know, every, you know, two months out of every hundred years or so. Kepler's third law is the law of planetary orbits, which says how long, which relates how long it takes an object to go around one full orbit and how that depends on the distance it is from the sun. So he found mathematically that there's a relationship that the square of the period, you know, I, I use P, I guess, in Physics 90, you know, we've been using T for the period. The square of the amount of time it takes for an, or, for an object to go around the sun is proportional to the cube of the, of the radius it is away from the sun. So proportionality, all that means is that it's related by a constant you know, a scale model is proportional to the actual object, uh, where it's like a scale model of a car. As you take a full car, scale everything down by the same amount. Uh, that just means that they are related by a constant. So that what Kepler was able to say is that the square of the period is equal to some number. I don't know what that number is, uh, but he says it's related to some number multiplied by the cube of the distance, the radius distance uh, between the object. Uh, and the sun. And he found that this relationship was the same for all the planets in the solar system. This is a movie, I believe, yes. Right, he found that if I were to measure, say, how long it takes Pluto or Neptune or the inner planets, Saturn, Jupiter, you know, Jupiter and Saturn, uh, way down in here is uh, Mars, Venus, Earth, and Mercury. Notice they're moving at very different rates. Seems like the farther out you are, the slower you're moving. Uh, so not only do they have more distance to cover, but they also seem to be, it seems to be that the farther away you are from the sun, the slower you move. Uh, so as a result, those both, both of those results tie together to create what is Kepler's third law, a relationship between the period and the radial distance you are away from the sun. I guess here's an example. You can see that Pluto is clearly not a circle. If I zoom in, uh, this red one is Mars, and then you got Earth, Venus, Mercury. 
And if you look, you can tell that Mercury's orbit is not a perfect circle. It's slightly offset compared to the others, which are mostly circular. So Kepler was able to come up with these three relationships to explain how the planets move in the solar system. But he had no reason, he had no justification for why these were three true laws. He just says, I'm really good at math. This data supports these three ideas. So I have three theories essentially that are supported by data. Um, here are my three laws of planetary motion. And that's how it stood for a while. Eventually enter Isaac Newton, uh, in which case we have to start asking ourselves, um, or rather Isaac Newton started to ask himself, uh, why? You know, Isaac Newton essentially said, why must this be the case? Why does the earth go around the sun in the way that it does? Why does it appear like the moon goes around the earth in the way that it does? Why, when I drop, uh, uh, where's my apple? You know, is there a different reason why when I drop this apple that it falls towards the earth? Are these objects, is this related at all? So the whole story, the, you know, may be apocryphal. Uh, but the idea that Isaac Newton was sitting under a tree, staring at the moon, then an apple fell from the tree onto his head. The story goes that they gave him a spark of insight, where he then realized that the explanation for why the moon goes around the earth and why the apple falls from the tree towards the ground were because of the exact same laws of physics that it was this thing called gravitation that allowed him to explain why apples fell when released you know, from a tree or why moons like our moon orbit around other objects. Then why say the earth orbits around the sun. He believed these all could be explained by the exact same ideas this universal law of gravitation. And so he came up with a plausible idea for what we call an orbit. The idea behind an orbit um, is that it can be thought of as a fall and a miss. I guess you're seeing the edges of my slides. You know, we could think of the orbit you know, we can think of an orbit as a fall and a miss. So here is his idea. You know, suppose I take this apple and I throw it out in front of me. Gravity from the earth will pull it down towards the ground and it'll eventually fall and hit the ground. All right, now suppose I throw it a little faster. It goes out even farther until it falls and hits the ground. Now suppose I go outside where there's nothing in my way and I throw it even harder. It will travel even farther before gravity eventually pulls it down and it falls and hits the ground. Now suppose I had, you know, the arm of, of Superman and I could throw the apple with such incredible speed that it just kept sailing out horizontally. Gravity would eventually start to pull the object downward but by the time it fell and hit the ground, the Earth had also started to, since the Earth is round, the Earth has also started to curve away of a little bit. So that's what you're seeing here. So the farther I throw, the Earth also will start to curve away from the object as it falls towards the ground. Now imagine I throw it farther and farther and farther until eventually it stops hitting the ground. Gravity continues to pull the object towards the ground, but by the time the object gets pulled down to that position, the Earth has itself curved away. You can imagine doing this until you are constantly falling towards the Earth 
but you are constantly missing the Earth. Every time you move to a certain location, the Earth itself has completely curved away, uh, leaving you suspended still in the air, while gravity continues to pull and pull yourself towards the ground in a different direction. This is the idea of what is an orbit. The orbit is an orbit is a fall and a miss. The moon is constantly falling towards the earth. But since the moon also has that, we can think of it as a horizontal velocity in a sense, since it's also moving to the left and to the right, by the time earth's gravity pulls it down, the earth itself has curved away. And so the moon does not collide with the earth. Now, when the moon is over here, Earth is pulling it towards the right, so the moon starts to fall towards the right. But by the time it moves over to where it would have hit the Earth, the Earth has curved away. That is the idea with an orbit. The Earth is constantly falling towards the sun. But because the Earth is also moving perpendicular to where the sun is located, the um, Earth is constantly falling towards the sun, but constantly missing the sun. Um, and therefore, that is an orbit of the Earth around the sun. The moon is falling towards the Earth, but constantly missing. Io, a moon of Jupiter, is constantly falling towards Jupiter, but continues to miss falling into Jupiter. This reasoning behind how gravity worked which eventually allowed Isaac Newton to write down his law of universal gravitation, which we will explore a little bit at the end of this lecture and in the next lecture. Allowed Isaac Newton to go back and actually prove all of Kepler's three laws. He was able to mathematically prove, yes, with my law of universal gravitation and my newly minted F equals MA, I can show that planets move around the sun in ellipses and circles. I can go and show that the planets move around the sun in equal areas in equal times. Turns out that's something called the conservation of angular momentum. That is the only re that is what Kepler's second law is saying. And I can derive what how long it takes an object to go around the sun and show that the square of the period, the square of the time it takes is proportional. To the cube of the radius of that orbit. Which that, you know, that gave Kepler's laws just incredible justification. It could now be mathematically proved. It was not only supported by data, but it was supported by theory as well. Newton's laws of motion and Newton's laws of universal gravitation. Just to briefly end on this, a little bit of an extension before we go back and think about Newton's law of gravity. Newton was able to come up with this law of universal gravitation as a way to explain the effects of gravity. Isaac Newton never was able to actually say what gravity was. What is this long range force? What is this thing that seems to be able to reach across the vacuum, to reach across the air and pull objects towards one another without having to be in contact with one another? He was never able to give an explanation. He only could describe gravity. He could never explain gravity and why these long range forces operate the way they do. It wasn't until Albert Einstein that we were actually able to try to come up with a plausible theory to explain what gravity was. Uh, not just how gravity worked, but what it actually was, how it originates. So the laws of special and general relativity, you know, laid the foundation for this understanding. Um, or Einstein's general theory of relativity, which incorporates ideas like gravity. said that the way that long range forces work is that there is that space can be thought of as this fabric, which he called space time, 
where space-time is essentially, you know, the coordinate system, you know, some sort of coordinate system that the universe resides within. And objects within the universe move around in the space-time coordinate system. It's not entirely accurate, but good enough to, for our, you know, to visualize. And he derived that the way that things work is that things that possess mass or energy, which he also showed is equivalent, E equals mc squared, that's another aside, that mass and energy have the effect that they distort the space-time fabric. And that distortion allows objects to move on top of that fabric in certain ways that could be explained and it gives the results that mimics what we call gravity. So the idea here is you can imagine I have some sort of ball and I have a flat piece of fabric and I call it space-time. It's completely flat and if I were to roll a ball across that fabric, the ball would travel in a straight line. As opposed to if I were to put, say, a heavy bowling ball in the middle of the fabric and then roll my marble or whatever it is across the fabric, but now there's this big indentation from that bowling ball. As a result, the marble takes a slightly curved path and might even curve completely around the bowling ball. In that case, before falling in because of the friction between the marble and the fabric. But for a frictionless space-time, you know, this curvature, the fact that this marble seems to move and be, you know, pulled towards this earth, and then as a result curves over to the left. The amount of deflection, the amount of, you know, effect that this curvature appears to have exactly matches what we predicted would be the case for gravity. So this gave, I, it lended an idea to what these long range forces are doing, that there's this thing which we call space time and gravity creates this gravitational distortion on top of it, this gravitational field, which through these distortions allows objects to respond to one another's presence without necessarily needing to be in contact with one another. You know, so the idea of say the moon going around the earth or I guess this could be the sun in the center and the earth, you know, going around it. You know, this very large, heavy sun creates a very big dip in the fabric of space-time. And so that dip allows the earth to roam around in a circle around the sun. You don't see these very much these days, but I remember as a kid, whenever I would go to grocery stores, there would be these big kind of bowls that you would send a penny down and the penny would orbit around in a circle for a really long time and eventually spin inward. Same sort of idea. Um, those actually originated, the idea of that originated because people were studying how gravity worked and the ideas of curvature of space. Not just to roll down pennies into a bin that, were that, that was then donated to a Goodwill or something. But the idea is that the sun creates a sub substantial dip, and as long as the Earth has some tangential motion, it orbits around in some sort of elliptical shape. In this case, it happens to be roughly a circle. But then the Earth itself, if you look at this ball that's moving around, the ball itself is also creating its own little local dip. Which, if there was something like the moon, the moon would get stuck in that little dip as they moved around together around the the sun, which has a larger curvature uh, that's being created from the sun. This was Einstein's you know, advance of how to understand kind of what gravity is, um, which Newton was unable to say. Newton essentially said all the universe is a stage and we all kind of do things on top of the on top of the stage. Um, you know, planets moving around, stars moving around, you know, apples falling, you know, from trees. Those were all taking place on the stage of the universe, which was unresponsive to what's going on um, on the stage itself, on, you know, in the universe. Essentially what Einstein says is that the universe is not just the stage, 
but the universe is an actor itself. That objects can cause the universe's curvature through space-time to distort and shift. And the universe as it, it itself responds to the presence of the actors on the stage. You know, the planets, the stars, the black holes, the apples falling, you know, whatever. Um, the universe is not only the stage, but is an actor itself. Um, which then future, you know, led to future models and theories about, you know, the ideas of how the universe itself expands and evolves. Our universe appears to be getting bigger with time. The idea, the leading idea that is yet to be refuted, uh, is that the universe started in a hot, dense state that underwent some sort of Big Bang uh, event. And the inertia of that event essentially propelled the universe forward and open. Uh, and that was the leading idea, you know, you know, up to like the 80s or so. Where then there be, or more, more than 90s, uh, at which case there started to become more observable evidence that the universe was not only expanding, you know, kind of as the inertia of the Big Bang would suggest it should, but the expansion rate was getting bigger and, bi you know, faster and faster. The universe is not only expanding, it's expanding at a faster rate, uh, which we attribute to this thing called dark energy. Uh, I guess the only, th yeah, this is not Physics 90, so I can't really go into what dark energy is, only to say that dark energy has nothing to do with dark matter, which is something completely different. Unfortunately, they have very similar names. Uh, dark matter, it seems to be this sort of invisible stuff that makes up the universe uh, that, none, that also kind of tries to pull things together. Most of the Milky Way is, is composed of this elusive dark matter, which is dark because we can't see it. Dark energy we say is dark because we have no idea what the hell it is. Uh, there, the word dark is more or less signifying our ignorance. Um, we can't see it, but we see its effects as well, but as they have nothing to do with one another. Uh, but that's for, you know, that's perhaps for an after hours uh, bonus lecture or something, or take Physics 90, or sit in on Physics 90. You know, and this, these ideas that Einstein came up with, um, yes, they did help explain things like the sun, the planets, you know, why the moon goes around the earth, why apples fall from trees, which are supported by Newton's laws. Yes, you know, so this shouldn't suggest that Newton's laws themselves are incorrect. Um, they are perfectly, perfectly valid within limits. Falling apples, uh, planets going around the sun, uh, for the most part, uh, can be perfectly explained uh, by Isaac Newton's laws of gravity. And so the next lecture where we look at Isaac Newton's law of gravity, um, you should not take it to mean that everything we're doing is wrong because Einstein showed that actually there's something better. Newton's law of gravity is perfectly, perfectly appropriate for most everyday human experiences. Most of my, all of my research on how stars form and evolve it's still perfectly appropriate for me to use Isaac Newton's law of gravity. It's only when you're near black holes, when you're dealing with the universe, when your system itself is the entire universe, uh, it's only in those kind of more extreme cases that you have to start worrying about the effects uh, that are, um, the effects that are captured by general relativity that are not captured by Isaac Newton's laws of motion. There are cases where Isaac Newton gives you the wrong answer. For everyday experiences, uh, you will never find one of those experiences. Uh, you really have to be dealing with very massive objects. Um, you know, for example, the idea of gravitational waves, which has been in the news a lot in the last couple years. The idea of gravitational waves is that you have two very massive objects, like black holes or neutron stars or something like that, and they are orbiting each other, like how the moon orbits the Earth. Um, and they create such a large distortion in the fabric of space that it's literally like taking a cloth and shaking it up and down. You know, there are ripples that get sent into space as a result. Uh, those are gravitational waves that we have now detected um, and have used it to essentially 
we've essentially created a new f subfield of astrophysics in the last couple of years with our ability to now detect gravitational waves, which were predicted by Einstein, but were not observed until you know a couple of years ago. All right, uh, what time am I at? 105, all right, I guess this is the end of this lecture. I guess we will uh, explore Isaac Newton's law of gravity um, entirely in the next lecture. But essentially it will amount to us studying his form for the law of gravitational attraction, which he said occurs between two objects with mass, so some mass m1, some mass m2, Maybe it's the sun and the earth. Maybe it's the apple and the earth. Maybe it's the moon and the earth. Maybe it's the Mars and Jupiter. Any two objects that have mass uh, are mutually attracted to one another through their gravitational tugs. Uh, and the magnitude of that force is given by an expression that is some constant g. So this is just a number the masses of the two individual objects, and then divided by the square of the distance between them. This is Newton's universal law of gravitation, uh, and we'll explore that in the next lecture.